with a left-hander up that he can run that two-seamer. It looks like it's going to hit you if you're a left-handed hitter, and it runs back over the plate. Very, very difficult for a lefty. Another 0-2. Right there. Strike That's three. That's the pitch. Yeah, that changeup away has been his strikeout pitch so far, especially to the right-handers. And, you know, he's just been living out there all night long. That's a great pitch by Brady Singer. Oh, sorry, Fastball, two-seamer right on the black. Starts it out. It's, it really starts in that, that left-hander's batter's box and comes out, comes back just over the plate. Working down. Tough for a right-handed hit. And he swings, gets it to third base. And instead of throwing That's going to plate the run, though. That's going to plate the run. The run crossed home plate before the tag was applied. And that is going to cut the lead to one as third baseman Connor Hood elects to go with the tag rather than the force out at first. Take a look at why that run counted for the Gators this last inning. So take us through it, Thomas. All right, so we got two outs here. The ball's fielded by Connor Hood, and rather than go for the force, he goes for the tag. And this is a great job by both Rivera to go back to second and India on third base to run hard through home plate. When India touches home before that tag is applied, that run then counts for Seton Hall. Had Connor Hood gone for the elected to go to first and got the force out, the run would not have counted. The other thing he could be asking for is a foul tip, because he did catch the ball, and if it was a foul tip, it would be strike three as well. So he could have been asking for either the swing or the foul tip caught by caught for strike three. I think it might have tipped his bat, but from that replay, it clearly went over it. Great spot by Dana there, change up low and away. We've seen it now a couple times to right-handers. Just real effective pitch for him right now. Second time he got him on the changeup this game. Got under his legs. What could have been a double play ball. Yeah, not sure if it goes to the left of his glove or under his legs, but what looks like a, should be a 5-4-3 double play. Instead, you got runners on first and second with one out for the Gators and Mike Rivera coming up. Lippet probably taking there just you know, a lot of times when guys aren't going to swing, they'll, they'll show bunt, try and throw the pitcher off a little bit. Walking back to the dugout already. Yeah, nice play by Hood to glove it on the dive. Throws back across his body, a little bit up the line, a full stretch by Matt. So we change up again, gets the strikeout. We'll see again here as Schwartz thinking fastball, and that change up just drops down a little bit. and. Schwartz swings right over. Yeah, let's take another look at this. I thought the throw was maybe a little low, but certainly should have been handled, but we'll see again. Yeah, Toke reaches for it. It just goes off the what looked like the webbing of his glove. Probably a ball he should have had. Instead, India over to second, Guthrie to third. With one out, the Gators are a base hit away from tying this game. Oh, and he hits wow. another one very hard. This one is a no doubt. Yeah, he did not miss that one. That one left in a hurry. And just another great job by Ryan Larson to battle Dana, not give in, not chase those pitches down. Work the count back in his favor and gets a pitch, and he does not miss it. Interesting curveball there in the dirt. Guthrie might be a little upset with himself as that could have been an opportunity to, to recognize that pitch down in the dirt and, and take second base. Just may not have seen it well enough out of Politi's hand. But that's something when you're a base runner there on, on first base, if you see that ball angled down where it's gonna bounce in front of the plate, you can get a more aggressive secondary. And when you see it bounce in the the catcher go down to his knees with that chest protector. You just take off for second and you make it down there easily, effectively. It was a long first game of the doubleheader. It went 13 innings and it played in Seton Hall's favor. Yeah, it was a grind, a real battle, real treat to watch. Seton Hall just kind of grounded out, executed to perfection, had the sack fly. Minor leaguer Thomas Di Benedetto will join us for our broadcasts this afternoon. You don't see doubleheaders in college anymore, so is the mindset different for them playing too? 
Yeah, for the players, especially in game one, it's really a, a similar mindset because come out just as any other game, typical BP infield outfield routine, similar coming to the ballpark. Doesn't really set in for the players until halfway through that game one where you're saying to yourself, oh, geez, we, we've got a, another nine innings after this. <laughs> yeah. The one area you might see a bit of change or alteration is in the coaching staff and some of those decisions, whether or not late in games you might pull some guys out of the lineup to get them a little rest, get ready for game two. You see behind the plate today, game one, giving J.J. Schwartz a little bit of a break. He's over at first base. You've got Brady Smith behind the plate. Maybe you see J.J. Schwartz behind the plate again in game two, a lot easier to catch that second game as opposed to catch game one and then tough on the knees coming out there game two. India, he almost smiled. He knew he had a play and a good throw home gets him, but with the score 9-1, just take the out at first. Max Mirkovich hits, he's 0 for 3. First pitch, a fastball, ball one. Now I will tell you, back in my days as a pitcher, I'm screaming inside to throw that ball home. Yeah, you don't want to learn run against you, that's for sure. Sort of a workman-like performance by Florida today. Yeah, completely agree. The big thing for me, and I think for Kevin O'Sullivan, was Tyler Dyson and his ability to command his curveball today. He was spotting that pitch effectively. Got four Ks today on that curveball. And when you're able to throw that pitch where you want to, I mean, that's that's really what they're going to need from him. They're going to need need that pitch working when they go up against some of these bigger bigger schools in the SEC and the games start to mean a little bit more. Again, not to take anything away from Rhode Island, but Dyson probably could have been effective again today without that pitch working for him, throwing that fastball 95-96, but I think he'll feel real good about himself and where he's going this season after today's performance. Back with some final comments. Stay with us. If you notice, Coar started this at bat trying to throw that curveball over that he, he missed. 1-1, one, one. another breaking ball there as a strike. That's the pitch to me that if you look at his last start versus Stony Brook, really the only blip was the command of that pitch. 1-2, change-ups low, 2-2. Two two. He obviously has got an incredible fastball, and that change-up is really his out pitch. The curveball, if he could get a little more consistency with it, can really make him a lethal pitcher. Rams second baseman Brodeur again playing way up the middle. Definitely going to be a throwing error on Dollar there. Ranging to his left, does a good job cutting it off. He actually got his momentum going towards first, but just just bounced the throw, and first baseman McManus couldn't come up with it. Leadoff man aboard for the Gators. Pretty good jump by Horvath there. Going on the 0-1 pitch. Catcher, Rams catcher Sonny Uliana's throw just up. Going back to that play by Reese, just, it's impressive to understand and have that mental clock in your head. Sometimes you'll see guys unnecessarily throw that off their back foot and play it into a single. Absolutely. You saw it in game one, too, with Janglos. Both guys really just try and move the ball around. They rely on their location and really pitching as opposed to throwing overpowering fastball. Lays off the high curveball, gets ahead in the count, then he gets a fastball, puts a good swing on it to the left center gap, and gives the Rams the lead 2-1. to one. Johnson up around 88, 89. Really kind of a change of pace, a lot harder than anything the Florida lineup has seen all day today. And it might not be 95, but when you've been seeing 84 all day, someone comes in throwing 88, 89. It's a little difficult to just flip that switch. Stathopoulos has kept the Rams more than competitive in this game. He's got himself out of some jams, first and third, back in the third inning, able to get out of that with surrendering just the one run. He's really pitching. He's not overpowering, but he's moved the ball in and out. He'll drop a curveball in there to get ahead in the count been pretty impressive so far man but they didn't they got a good start from their starting pitcher and almost pulled it off yeah they gave it everything they had as you said got the barn doors 
blown off in games one and two and come back and not only be competitive but really be in a position to win the game leading two to one in the ninth like that and who knows what this will do for the gator team going forward here absolutely when you're in the bottom of the ninth and you need a run or you lose the game it doesn't matter who you're playing to come back and not just get the one but get two and walk off with it in the ninth you know that's something they will remember as the season moves on and freshman jordan butler with two strikes on him coming through getting that hit through the right side there for all intents and purposes be easy to fold over in that at bat they had already tied it pressure's not really on him there but does a great job with two strikes putting a good swing on it and just a great team win as kevin o'sullivan said there lost in the shuffle was jack lefwich bouncing back after a tough outing that didn't go as well as he would have liked versus ucf but he's as much a reason for the final score in the w as anyone tonight all right good working with you today